So our next speaker is going to be uh, Filippo Falino, who is Director uh, of Research at the CNRS and a professor at the Ecole des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales. And the uh, discussant will be Stephanie Novak, PhD student in Political uh, Sciences, and she studies uh, in particular decision-making in the EU uh, Council of Ministers. So uh, my paper is about uh, collective decision and uh, a special kind, uh, collective decision of special groups, uh, committees or commissions, uh, which I call uh, arrêt ou page, but it's not, uh, it's not very important. So uh, my question is, how best to foster collective wisdom in collectives of the wise? The question is for this kind of committees of sages, of wise, of experts, which have important decisions to make for a social group. So just uh, uh, some point of definition. Areopage are groups that deliberate to make decisions or advices that are applicable, applicable to a larger group. Members of these commi this committees are appointed rather than elected. And they are appointed, appointed first and foremost for their competence. Third, the collective work of these committees bears on to both the decision itself and argumentation to justify that decision. Uh, the, the committees has to the, commi the committees have to produce decision and reasons and justification of the decisions. And fourth point, individual members have to practice the, disi the discipline of arguing in a special way their position in accordance with uh, certain validity requirements. Uh, these requirements constitute a kind of argumentative discipline uh, which can be characterized by the four points. Justifications, reasons override motives. Secondly, the, ju the justification has to be uh, substantial. It's not enough to say, I am for X because of a reason Y. It's not enough. You, are, you need to have a line of reasoning. The argumentation has also to be appropriate. There is a, a specialized argumentation linked to the issues of the committee. And finally, there is a contextual validity that uh, depends of each case at hand. So, what is the problem of such committees? As unanimity is quite scarce, uh, a collective decision-making rule is needed. Voting is a good way to obtain a final point, but voting has an uncertain relationship with the quality of a collective decision. So the problem is uh, how to combine number and reasons, how, as uh, as written uh, plainly, how can votes be counted and weighed? Uh, maybe we can see what, have, uh, what the, the Western monastic orders uh, gave us as lessons. And maybe we have too much the, the, the tendency to, to see the history of decision-making rules in Western monastic orders, which are quite well known, as only an historical way to, to go toward the majority rule. Uh, the unstable solution they, they find at the moment was mixing senior pass 
and myopause. What was exactly this uh, combination? Uh, I think we can characterize uh, this uh, mixing senior pass and major pass in two points. The split of collective decision process in two parts and uh, hierarchical ordering principles. I explained that. Uh, we have wise part and majority part. What is the splitting of a decision-making process? It's very simple. On the, on the one hand, judgments and votes of participants. And on the other hand, evaluation of these judgments and of the result conducted by a part of the participants of a collective uh, decision-making process or by others who are out of a process, of a first process. And what is uh, what, I, what I call a hierarchical ordering principle? Uh, without universally shared criteria, we know that uh, we can't determine the wisest part without give to an instance uh, some authority. So we need prior to the process of decision or inside to have a way to say which is the instance which have authority. I think that this problem is sometimes always the problem of contemporary committees. Because they have quite the same problem that the uh, monast uh, uh, as the, the monasteries, and I, I will take two different examples of contemporary means of finding a compromise between wise part and majority part. Two examples taken from the, the field of medicine evaluation, the French case which is the French Drug Approval Committee, <coughs> and the case of FDA and its advisory committees. Uh, maybe I will have not enough time for uh, talking about the two cases. So I, I begin by the French Drug Approval Committee, which is a little bit more complex. And uh, if, I, if I have enough time, I will speak about the, the FDA and its adv advisory committees. So the French case. And the main point is that the French case use a special kind of decision-making rule I call decision-making by exertion of objections. I will have five points. First, I will... Uh, give some information about the conditions of the appearance of this committee. Uh, secondly, I, I will explain that it rejects vote and use uh, what they call consensus decision. In a third part, I will try to describe what is this process of decision-making by consensus. And I will explain what is it exactly and what I, why I call it apparent consensus. And fourth, in the fourth point, I will explain that they use a special kind of decision making by apparent consensus. And finally, I will uh, mention some weakness of this rule of decision making. So, first of all, some historical points. The uh, French Drug Approval Committee has been created in uh, 1978 for reducing uh, a gap between the quality of a French medicine evaluation and those of other countries, especially uh, United States one, Swedish one, English one. And the national proud, proud was very uh, hurted 
when French <coughs> administration and politicians discover that they were very bad in this field. Uh, so uh, the, com the committee has, be has been composed of a new generation of experts who have learned for the first time a new discipline, which was clinical pharmacology, and who, were, uh, who, who had the competence to uh, perform the new kind of evaluation of medicine which was appearing at this moment. But the administration has not the finance to hire these people. So they were put, put in together in a, in a committee uh, with a meeting every month, every two weeks. But they, they worked and they work a lo uh, always in hospitals uh, and other places. Between uh, 1978 and uh, 2000, uh, approximately, uh, approximately the, the committee had uh, 30 members appointed for three years. Uh, a point very important, and it is a, 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 a striking difference with the uh, American case. Uh, this committee concentrates all the high-level expertise on the evaluation. And the administration of health, or now the agency for medicine, since uh, 1993, uh, uh, can't reassessing the committee evaluation inside the administration of the agency. So, in fact, the committee makes the decision, except some very scarce cases. From the beginning to now, this committee doesn't use, uh, do not use, doesn't use vote, but only consensus. Why? At the beginning, it was a fear, fear of contestation of, by pharmaceutical firms and medical milieu because it was completely new. But uh, it has been always, also always, uh, there were always two ideas and two arguments, and we can have it when we, we, we have discussion with the members. They they think that voting is not appropriate for reaching a special decision with strong epistemic nature. And they have also the idea that discussion of medicines can culminate in opinion convergence. So, what is this decision making by, by consensus? If it is not a vote with unanimity rule, when you interview people, they say, that's very simple. We, we, we discuss and we have a consensus. And if we have not, we discuss again. It's a, just a, a question of time and of discussion. But, but it's not exactly true. It's not enough. It's not false, but it's not enough. The problem to understand what we call in anthropology or in other place. Collective decision by uh, making by consensus is how people know that the decision is taken. You need a phenomenolo phenomenological dimension uh, of decision making. Members of a process have to know when we are arrived to the final point. So, I how I can know that we have a consensus if we don't vote and if we have not a rule of unanimity? Uh, if, you, if you have this question in mind when you observe the process, and we have uh, observed the process, interviews are not enough. You are 
seeing a, a decision-making process, what I call apparent consensus, which has a specific sequence and two major characteristics. What is the sequence? A member, the chairman, present, uh, presents the, the issue, the problem. Secondly, the members discuss this presentation. After, a member, often the chairman, make, makes a proposal of decision. And at this moment, there is two possibilities. Some of the members explicitly approve and the others do not express anything. <coughs> In this case, the proposal is the decision. Second possibility, at least one participant contests the proposal of decision. In this case, the discussion, the discussion has been to as to, uh, to to going um, away, uh, to, to to going on, to, to going on. And another member, maybe the chairman, always give a new proposal, and you are always two possibilities. And if at the end all the proposals have been the object of contestation, we cannot take the decision. And we have to, to wait another meeting. That is the, the sequence. Two major characteristics. No systematic expression or counting of opinions. It's the big difference with vote. Decision is that it's only a proposal which have not been... Uh, which has, has not been uh, contested. And apparent consensus is not unanimity because no explicitly rejection, it's very different that visibly, unanimous, unanimously approving. It's not the same thing. So it is an apparent consensus. Some of who remain silent do not approve, approve, but no longer contest. This is what I call apparent consensus, and we can find this process in very different cases. African palaver, international organization, and uh, many, in many places. I think that uh, the, the rule, the decision-making rule, that the drug, French Drug Approval Committee uses is a, a kind of this family of decision-making rule. And my idea is that this family of decision-making, of, of collective decision-making rule, rules, uh, could be cut in two, in two kinds depends on the status of the contesting of a proposal. This contesting could have two different status. It is only a rejection. And this rejection is an unconditional veto right. If you contest, there is a veto. We have to discuss again. What is conditional is not the veto. It's the possibility to use the veto. Uh, because there are some resources, uh, I can, there, is, there are some costs when I use my veto right. Somebody can, could be able to uh, do something what I have to pay because he don't want uh, I use my veto right. So this un unconditional veto right could be the point of departure of bargaining. Uh, it's that uh, 
Sherif El Hakim and James Coleman have uh, well seen uh, about uh, consensus decision. But there is another status for the contesting of a proposal, which is an objection. In this case, the veto is conditional. The objection has to be accepted, has to be deemed valid by others. But the use of objection is not conditioned by resources or licit bargaining, because we are in cases where usually, and in a legitimate way, there is no interest. You have no cost or benefit, or benefit uh, uh, linked to the decision that uh, will, reach, will reach after the process. Uh, let's see more, some more points about, about this decision by exhaustion of objections. What is the, the meaning of a silence of a member facing a proposal? I think that uh, when a member remains silent facing a proposal of decision, there is three situations. Uh, three possible situations. First, he is convinced. So he could ap approve, but he, he, could, he can also uh, do nothing, no, expressing nothing. The other possibility is that he doesn't know what is good, what is the good decision. He has not, he has not worked enough, or he is not competent enough on the special issue of the day. So he delegates his judgment to the other. And the third uh, possibility is that the member is not convinced, but he doesn't have a good argument. You know? uh, he's not convinced by the proposal, but he has no good argument. And he, can contest, he cannot contest without what he it deems to be a good argument, an argument that would be uh, accepted by the others. Maybe to, to understand better what is the specificity of this decision-making rule, we can... Uh, uh, project the categories of vote on this rule. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I make this, uh, this picture. Uh, what's happened facing a proposal of decision? The, the members have different mental states, reasons, and preference. They could be convinced they, they could be indeterminated and they delegate their judgment. They could be not convinced but having not argument. And they could be not convinced but they know that they, they think that they have an argument. Validable. After you have the expressions, when you are in a, in a, in a, in a case, the case of uh, the three possibilities, your expressions could be explicit approval or no expression. You have no expression. What is the value of this expression? The value is that is in favor of a proposal as it stands. It's only when you have argument and you use it to contest, to object, that you, your expression is an explicit disapproval, and this expression counts as uh, an expression against the proposal as it stands. So it's a special case, because you can see that the, in the vocabulary of vote, the vote yes, the vote abstain, the vote no, but no argument, are in the vote 
yes. Okay. In which way can we say that it is a little bit like uh, mixing ma senior parts with major parts? Major parts. Uh, we have the splitting of the collective decision process. The objective minority, because it is always uh, one people, one member, two or three, who at a moment facing a proposal, at a moment of a process, who object. The, when you have a proposal, facing of a proposal, you have a kind of a distribution of uh, mental states, reasons and preference. And you have some expression, as I have shown in the, the, the last uh, slide. In this case, the objecting, the, objecting, the objecting minority judges the proposal and, by the way, the virtually silent majority who was approving the proposal. And I think we have also, in this case, a kind of hierarchical principle we observe prevalence of reason and preference, of wisdom, of number, in three ways. The objecting min minority win if the argument is deemed valid. valid. Only two ways to express preferences. There, is a, there are only two ways. Not contesting proposal or contesting it with an argument. And thirdly, the proposal become decision if it had exhausted objections, not because it would have won everyone's vote. And uh, there is another point about the hierarchical principle, is that unequal member influence is recognized uh, legitimate. And I finished on two weeks point of this process. It tolerates a lot delegation of judgment because I can s remain silent, maybe because I approve, but be maybe because uh, I don't know what I have to think. And uh, the other wing point is that it presupposes a profound agreement on the evaluation approach. Why? The problem is not the, the risk to have a lot of objections. It could be, but the main point is that maybe there were no convergence about the validity or the invalidity of objections. Maybe we, we can think on this point, that there is a kind of indefinite regression. I do not think so, because, uh, and I, I'm thinking about a point uh, well known of Scanlon in a very different context, is that it's less difficult to have a convergence about rejections than about approval. And uh, the collective advisor for FDA, FDA will be for another time. So I finish there. Thank you. So your discussion is Stephanie Novak. So I was really glad to read your papers. It's in the line of the research of your article about decision making by apparent consensus. Um, in this paper that you published in 2007, you define this decision rule. Indeed, apparent consensus uh, is only a procedure, and uh, you described different kinds of use of consensus. And in this presentation today, uh, you show that it can that it is suited to collective decision making in uh, areopage. So basically, consensus differs from uh, unanimity. 
uh, since it is only the absence of objection, uh, while unanimity is an explicit agreement of the voters. And uh, when a group makes a decision with the rule of apparent consensus, uh, the chair proposes synthesis of the debate, and when nobody shows any sign of opposition, the proposition, the proposition is deemed uh, to be adopted by consensus. So it means that to be established, consensus requires the authority and the decision power of the chair, and it also means that there is no counting of votes. So given these two features, that is the power of the chair and the absence of counting, uh, my questions will be about their influence on uh, collective decision-making and on the expression of uh, collective wisdom. I know that you did not pretend to talk about the normative aspects uh, of consensus and voting in your presentation, but maybe for the discussion uh, we can talk about the normative consequence consequences of your, of your concept and of your description. Um, so I have a first question about the power of the chair. Uh, so the chair has lots of power, actually, since she has the power to formulate the summaries of the debate and to choose the time when to propose the adoption of her synthesis. So in a way, the wisest man among the wise men makes the decision. So do you think this influence of the chair can limit uh, the expression of a collective wisdom? And did actors uh, during the interviews talk about this problem? Uh, because I thought about the, um, the fact that during the Convention for the Future of Europe, uh, Giscard d'Estaing decided that decisions would be made by consensus and uh, without voting. Um, but his way of uh, establishing consensus uh, was sometimes criticized by members of the, of the Convention. And also, because of this power of the chair, uh, another limit for the expression of collective wisdom uh, is, uh, as you said, judgment delegation. So do you have data about a judgment delegation? Uh, is it frequent? The, did actors talk about that in, 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 during the interviews? So my second question is about uh, transparency. Um, because I have the impression that apparent consensus is less transparent than, than voting. Um, the adv advantage of voting is that it is intrinsically more transparent since it's based on counting. Uh, consensus is apparent. Uh, it means that it is established because everybody can see and can hear uh, that no one speaks out against uh, the consensus proposal. But um, do you think that to counterbalance uh, the power of the chair and, uh, in a way, the lack of transparency of consensus, uh, the openness and the transparency of sessions could be a solution? Um, I, I ask this, I'm asking this question because I'm puzzled by the fact, uh, so you didn't talk about the two committees, uh, but um, about both committees in your presentation, but in your paper, uh, I noticed that uh, the French committee is decided by consensus and their sessions are not public, while the American advisory, advisory committees uh, do vote and their sessions are public. Uh, so am I right uh, with this, in this dis distinction? And do you think that there could be a, an explanation to, to this link uh, between the consensus and um, the fact that it is not open on a side and uh, voting and the fact that it is transparent uh, on the other side. Um, thirdly, I've got a, a remark. Um, so in your paper, you, you quote experts and, you, and their explanations about the fact uh, that they, they try to explain why they do not vote. And the French experts uh, give, I have the impression that they give biased reasons. Uh, they say that they do not vote because it would not be legitimate that people who are more specialized have the same influence as uh, less specialist people. But in fact, voting does not imply uh, the equality of the voters. Uh, there could be a weighting of votes. Uh, and besides, they say that they don't vote because they attempt to reach agreement. Uh, but there are unanimous votes. Uh, voting does not prevent from reaching agreement. Um, so I, I have the impression that the true reason why they do not vote is that they do not want to count. 
since they want to argue, they cannot, uh, they cannot count. Uh, and maybe they give these biased reasons uh, for not voting because uh, they do not have in mind other categories um, of decision rules than the, than the ones the ones which are based on counting. Um, finally, uh, as I told you, I um, I saw that uh, in your paper you show uh, that uh, uh, there there cannot be. Uh, a majority which is right, uh, and so you because that's what sets uh, Benedictus, and uh, I found it weird. But in fact, your dis demonstration and this uh, point is quite uh, is quite uh, bright, uh, and so uh, you say that only a minority can be right. So in your in your um, um, in your in your tables, you you sh you you use uh, the expression an objecting minority, but finally, I'm not sure about uh, this expression. Maybe there can be a, an objecting majority uh, of members uh, who can be right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for these uh, uh, four or five uh, very good questions. Um, first, about the power of a chairman and uh, its consequences about the maybe the collective wisdom. First, uh, I have to say that uh, yes, he has a lot of influence and he's, he, have, he has a lot of, of work uh, to formulate the proposal and to to listen to the objections, to it's the job of a chairman. So, I think, it, first of all, obviously, to make the proposals, it's very important. It's a very big determination of a process. But it's not all the, the power in the game, because it's not enough. To, to give the proposal. You have to give a very good proposal because if you are not good enough, you are very quickly completely ridiculous because you have a lot of objections. And uh, I have some reports made by one of my students about a s similar kind of a, a committee with the same rule. And the president is not the chairman is not good, and it's a complete disorder. It's a very it's a problem. So it's a difficult job, and each proposal it's kind of um, uh, a risk. So it's it's very it's a, a big determination, but you have to anticipate all the objections to be a good chairman. And I think uh, uh, too much good chairman could absorb too much of a process. And a bad chairman uh, 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 produce disorder and uh, maybe bad decisions. So it is for the, the first question. The second question is linked with the first uh, the delegation is of a profit of colleague. My, my colleague, the other member, is more competent uh, on these meetings. You know, in, in a meeting, they have to make decisions about maybe 10, 5 medicines. That depends on the importance of, uh, of the issue. And for one medicine, the member uh, feels competent and he, he has worked a lot about the information, the data, and he is <coughs> completely committed in the process. And uh, 30 minutes after, we are discussing about another medicine. It's not his field. He, work, he worked less and he delegates to the other. But the problem is it's that 
as the chairman, has to be very competent. It could be, uh, we could have a deterioration of a process. The chairman and his team are very competent, and there is a gap bit of competence between the chairman, its, his team, and the others. And we are in another uh, game. We have a team of uh, uh, a few people completely committed in the process, very competent. We are only testing their idea, their proposal to a more uh, to a larger team of less committed and less competent people, and it's only a process of uh, information testing. You know. Uh, Transparency. I, I, I forgot to say that, uh, that you have said. Uh, we are in the case of secrecy. And uh, the members have to not speak about the discussion inside the process. Uh, I, I don't see why. <laughs> I think it's, it was a French tradition the pharmaceutical industry was absolutely against uh, publicity. And I think they are wrong, because I think that now their interest is publicity. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know exactly uh, why they uh, maintain secrecy. I have a, a, an hypothesis. It is that we are in French and not in the United States. And the conflict is less strong in France. In France, even if you have an agency, it's administration, we can contest too much. In the United States, the agency is always the target of very strong attacks. And the, 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 trans, the, the transparency is quite a, a, a good protection for a moment. Yeah. And finally, about the experts... And the minority, um, well, I don't know if it is a, a, a true idea or a joke. I don't, I don't know exactly. Uh, I explained that, but maybe it's not enough important. You know that uh, Benedict uh, uh, was speaking about three cases. Uh, the three cases where unanimity who made the good choice, the right decision. Unanimity or majority who uh, make the bad choice, the unwise decision. And the minority who made the good choice, the senior minority. And all the commentators have uh, said that it's strange because Benedict uh, didn't, uh, didn't speak about the majority who is right. You know, we have more condorcet in, in mind, but for Benedict, this case do not exist. That's strange. And when I was uh, uh, drawing this, uh, this thing, uh, I was uh, amazing that we can say that majority is never, is never right. Because usually people who are objecting are a few. So they are quite a minority. And if the, the objection is uh, accepted, the minority won. won. And at the end, it's not a majority who take the decision. It is uh, an apparent unanimity. Wow. So I don't know if it is a, a joke with words of, or if there is something uh, more interesting behind that. Okay, thanks very much. We have four people have asked to the floor. So Pasquale is the first. Yes, I... I find your analysis extremely interesting. As you know, I've been trying to show that the constitutional courts, notably in Germany and Italy, use the same process for decision-making. 
I think we should stress probably that this mechanism of decision making requires a special size of the group. So only a very small group of people can use that. And I want to focus, I have a lot of other comments, but I want to uh, pick up one question asked by uh, Madame Novak, the normative dimension. I'm strongly persuaded that such a committee, for normative reason, cannot use majority rule. Why? Because the member of these committees are not accountable. Elected officials are accountable. Majority is under the control of the voters. Now, these people are not, so they have no legitimacy to impose the will or even the competence of a section, even the majority of the body. They must find, they ought to find a consensus. Then there are a lot of other aspects we should stress more notably that the members of this committee are not equal like the voters because when people start to argue, they immediately stop being equal. Voters are micro-sovereigns. They are equal among them because they don't need to explain why they are voting like they are voting. These guys, as you said many times, they only have the instrument of arguments. If they do not have arguments, they count for nothing. And if they have weak arguments, they count for less. For a part, I agree with you, but there is a problem. There, is, there are other cases we vote. The Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in America. And I have another case I have to study now. It is the Drug Approval Committee in the European Agency. They vote. That's uh, a point. I think this yes. is the wrong Yes. But they have the same normative problem. And they can vote. And I think that's behind there is a, a, a normative dimension, which is the, the status of conflict. If they vote, do they need unanimity or just majority? No, majority. Majority, majority, and they they, they give reasons, <laughs> but uh, I think behind that we have not enough enough time. We don't have much time. Uh, there is the status of conflict. Yeah, you, we'll we'll have a, a break just after, so we can continue. Um, well, I accept uh, Pasquale's sure. point about accountability, but comparing majority rule and and consensus rule, there is nothing that precludes argument being used in a majority committee. So. The essential difference between majority and consensus is not argumentation. The essential difference is the voting rule, whether it's majority rule or unanimity rule. And um, um, when you that list that you have of the of silence, the the three reasons for the sil- members to be silent, that's not an exhaustive list because there's a fourth option that one could think that the consensus appro- proposal is wrong. Um, but acquiesce to avoid retaliation on future consensus votes, which people are prone to do um, in consensus decision-making, as I know from experience, or in fear of social sanctions. Um, And just to be quick, to come back to the point about you say that the, the decision rule is not unanimity rule, but unanimity rule and veto by one person are law... Are, are, are logically equivalent. I don't see how they are not logically equivalent. So for you, there is uh, some bridge between objection and rejection. Uh, in the sense that even with objection, you can have bargaining about the objection. We can fear retaliation, retaliation yes. if I object. Yes. Uh, in the case I was studying, I think there is no this problem. Because, except if people are, uh, hide, hide uh, interest, mm. Personal uh, agendas, yeah. and except if there are some <laughs> hidden bargaining of interest, uh, 
we approve these drugs and I leave the approval of the others. Maybe in, uh, in this case, we are, for me, in the case of rejection. But it's a case that we could imagine. Uh, I think it's a, I, I, I agree with the possibility of this case. I don't think it is the case I have studied. No? I have studied. But uh, I agree with uh, the, the, the relevancy of this, uh, of this configuration. Christian, this. Yeah, my point actually connects with Jerry's um, point. It's sometimes conceptually useful to draw a distinction between a balloting procedure on the one hand and an aggregation procedure on the other hand, where the package of the two of them forms a fully-fledged voting procedure. Um, now, um, one way to think about your um, proposal is like this. The balloting procedure is the procedure that describes how the signals that um, individuals uh, express to the aggregation procedure are precisely revealed, how they are solicited, and so on. The aggregation procedure determines how those signals, um, once they have been expressed, are counted and, and you know, translated into the resulting collective decision. Now, um, one could say here that um, what you're proposing is a different balloting procedure from the one usually used with unanimity rule, but the aggregation procedure is still the same. And let me just briefly say why this is a, a way of looking at this, and I think this connects with, with Jerry's point. Um, in both the case of the no veto procedure or no objection procedure and the unanimity rule, there are essentially bin binary signals at the stage of the aggregation. So the signal is either positive or negative. The difference is at the stage of the balloting procedure in how um, the actions of the committee members are coded as the signals. So with the standard unanimity rule, only explicit approval is counted as a positive signal, while silence or explicit disapproval is counted as a negative signal. Whereas in, under your proposal, basically silence, explicit approval, all of this is counted as a positive signal, and only the explicit objection is counted as a negative signal. And so one might say, of course, that, for instance, the costs or constraints on uh, you know, expressing these, these two different types of signals are rather different under these two different balloting procedures. But then the mechanics of the aggregation is still the same. Okay. It could be contingent on his case. You, I, it could be contingent on your case. You could easily have a consensus procedure which started accidentally with the tradition of the chair calling for unanimity or started accidentally from the chair asking for objections. Sorry. Um, I, will think, I will think about uh, your suggestion, but um, I will be interested in it to, to, to be able to, to, to have an aggregation model. But uh, there is the problem of the validity of the objection. No? That is the difference. So it's not pure aggregation because there is a test. Is the, the, the objection uh, good or, or bad? And that depends on the judgment of the others. You know? So maybe... It's in the control of the objector. The objectors the of, the of the committee, yes. So the question is the, the, uh, about the wisdom of the, uh, the working of the committee that you just very inter interestingly described. So I feel quite happy as a French citizen to know that such a committee is deciding which medicines are put on the market. It seems reasonable enough. But is it because of a procedure uh, uh, having you know, a, a decision by, by exhaustion of objection or by apparent consensus, or is it because there are experts plus this uh, procedure? So uh, as you pointed out, the procedure of decision by consensus is found in lots of different cases, for instance, in, in African tribal society, where I did myself field work uh, in the south of Ethiopia. I observed many, many assemblies working exactly like that. But there, the means of social pressure uh, here, in, in your case, you are expert to meet just for expertise. We may not even socialize or having so, that much means of pressure on one another out in, in, in their social life otherwise. In, in this uh, uh, African society, the people who are meeting in the co committee uh, could exert pressure on, on each other in the social sphere. And so people are more poor, more expertise uh, in, in the societies 
practically made it very uh, costly uh, for the more junior people uh, to express themselves. And so, uh, you know, I, I, to use a, st- a, a famous phrase, uh, what the, the working the decision by consensus Im- amounted to a manufacture of consent in many respects. Don't you think, Philippe, that we should make a distinction between perhaps it begins with semantics. The, no, the notion of objection here can be ambiguous. If we think of the formula, does anyone have objections? That could designate either pure open voting, just raising your hand, and that's one mode that qualifies under your general rubric. Now, there is another version of it in which objection is understood in a more substantive sense, in the sense of the reason-giving requirement, or rather, that would be the objection-raising requirement, but in a substantial way, that is, you have to give a good reason against. And these two things are not the same, so that, uh, I think, it would clarify the conceptual structure if we said, that your, the generic category of your de- decision, your new decision-making rule by consensus, consists in making a decision or reaching a decision when no one is opposing it. And it can be, you know, it can go exactly along your lines. The, the chair synth- synthesizes the previous discussion and then said, does anyone object? Just raising your hands. That's the generic mode. And there's that, a a subversion of this, is that plus the reason-giving requirement, or rather the objection or the substantial objection-raising requirement. That would be, I suspect, combining... Maya and Sanyo Paz. <laughs> this, I'm sorry, it's not, a, not quite a question, but <laughs> would you just, as people say in these circumstances, would you agree with that characterization? <laughs> not quite a question and not quite short, I must say. Anyway, Philippe, yes. you have the last no, word. <laughs> I, I agree completely. Maybe in my talk I was not uh, enough uh, explicit, but I think in the paper the idea is that objection is giving reasons. Yes. 